Now, I want to raise the question, am I simply, am I correct in my reading of Buddhism? As I will now condense the text that you were given to get an idea what I'm aiming at. In the last decades, critics of my reading of Buddhism abound. A representative of these critics are Adrian, I hope I pronounced it correctly in the Slavic way, because Ivakivs, Nagarjuna and Ecophilosophy, and then, not on me, but more generally, John Clark on being none with nature, Nagarjuna and the ecology of uh, emptiness. Ivakiv nicely begins with presenting the core Buddhist concept of dependent origination. The idea is that every identity is process relation, relational position, which means that, say, a tree's existence as a unitary object as opposed to a collection of cells is conventional. Removing the properties of a tree leaves no core bearer behind. Thing, the thing we call a tree is empty of inherent self-existence. Its essence is nothing other than the properties and its conditions of self-manifesting. End of quote. This goes against Graham Harman's, the new objectivist, and others' argument that there is something more to any object than its properties, relations, and conditions. For Buddhism, there is nothing, no thing left over. And then another uh, quote, uh, but that is not to say that there is in fact nothing. There is the process relational flux of what John Clark calls nature naturing, the continuum coming into existence and passing away of the experiential bits of the world, all of which is quite real. So what this implies is that the negative or deconstructive project that Nagarjuna, the great Mahayana classic, <laughs> is best known for goes hand in hand with an affirmative, reality-based project of the sort that in current continental philosophy is best represented by Gilles Deleuze. Or, to quote uh, Clark, for Buddhism, the negative path of the destruction of illusion is inseparably linked to the positive path of an open, awakened, compassionate response to a living, non-objectifiable reality. The nature that is no nature. End of quote. But this brings us, I think, to what I see as the central challenge for Buddhism. How do we, humans, get caught into a dream world of illusory, deceptively permanent objects and egos, and the futile quest to defend the ego and dominate reality. Is it enough to say that this is a fundamental human predicament? That is to say, a trans-historical invariant. John Clark makes here, I find this quite interesting, a surprising move into, yes, into, let's call it a Marxist direction. A quote from John Clark. Where most analysis, including most Buddhist analysis of egocentric consciousness and the egoic flight from the trauma of luck, stop short is in failing to investigate the social and historical roots of this phenomena. We must understand that the ego is not only a psychological and epistemological construct, but also a historical one. Its roots are to be found 
in the development of large-scale agrarian society and regimented labor, the rise of the state and ancient despotism, the emergence of economic class and acquisitive values, the triumph of patriarchy and warrior mentality. In short, in the evolution of the ancient system of social domination and the domination of nature. To put it in Buddhist terms, our true karmic burden, both personally and collectively, is our profound historicity and our deep materiality. End of quote. But the question remains here, I think, how far can we go in this direction of historicizing? Where individuals in pre-class societies dwelling in a living, non-objectifiable reality, the nature that is no nature, and so should the possible post-capitalist society also be conceived as a liberation from the so-called will of desire. Another question lurks beneath this one. Why should the destruction of illusion lead to compassion rather than to cynicism, as it, is, as it often seems to in everyday life, or to social conservatism, as it has in the case of human and other forms of philosophical scepticism. That's, I think, uh, the key question. I think that in spite of all desperate attempts to demonstrate that the way to Buddhist enlightenment goes through modesty and compassion, the only honest answer, I think, is that of Daisek Taitaro uh, Suzuki, the great popularizer of Buddhism. For him, Zen is a technique of meditation which is compatible with any political orientation, liberalism, fascism, communism, whatever. This brings us back to the Buddhist critique of my work. For evocative, this is the point where Buddhism meets psychoanalysis. Quote, the key difference between Freud, Lacan, Zizek, ah, I don't deserve this, he put me in this triad, and Nagarjuna is that the former presupposes that the rise of dominating ego is unavoidable. The best we can do is to come to terms with the ego process and try not to get too caught up in the delusional tricks it plays on us. End of quote. This is why my work for Ivakiv totally ignores, quote, the real potential of actually reading Western Buddhism, not just in the light of Lacan, but in the light of the teachings of the Buddha and their lineage. This real potential is, of course, as we have already seen, the affirmation of the flux of positive life. Ivakiv introduces here uh, uh, quotes, a long quote from Suzuki. And uh, he begins it ironically with this note. Suzuki, whom Zizek has probably never read, a trained Zen Buddhist, as well as a professor of Buddhist philosophy, and delightfully fluent writer and speaker of English, echoes Vajiya when he writes about Zen as an absolute life affirmation. Incidentally, not only did I read Suzuki, I wrote extensively on him, on his extreme militarism. Suzuki, in, I've spoken about this, in this place years ago, Suzuki totally legitimized uh, Japanese militarism, claiming only a warrior who went through the experience of nirvana can function 
as a perfect killing machine, literally. But let's drop that. Here is a quote of, uh, uh, from Suzuki. We live in affirmation and not in negation. For life is affirmation itself. And this affirmation must not be the one accompanied or conditioned by a negation. Such an affirmation is relative and not at all absolute. With such an affirmation, life loses its creative originality and turns into a mechanical process, grinding forth nothing but soulless flesh and bones. To be free, life must be an absolute affirmation. Then abhors repetition or imitation of any kind, for they kill. For the same reason, Zen never explains, but only affirms. Life is a fact, and no explanation is necessary. To explain is to apologize, and why should we apologize for living? To live, is that not enough? Let us then live, let us affirm. Herein lies Zen in all its purity and in all its nudity as well. That's uh, Suzuki from an introduction to Zen Buddhism. Now, I want to return to my critic, Ivakiv, who proposes a Lacanian reading here. Far from, for Ivakiv, far from advocating a renunciation to our desires, Buddha, quote, is suggesting that staying true to our desire will yield the satisfaction of that and all desire. Whereas Lacan is less interested in what it would mean to satisfy our desire if it is once we have properly identified it. End of quote. How can this be? Ivakiv introduces here sexual difference. He interprets what Lacan calls the impossibility of the sexual relationship as the impossibility to reach the goal of the masculine phallic subject, which is to swallow, dominate entire reality. From this phallic standpoint, Buddhism, a quote, appears as a phantasmatic spectra in the West, where masculine jaisons is predominant. Buddhism at once promises and threatens with the other dark feminine jaisons. Buddhism is only conceivable in what Zizek might call the Western ideological matrix as this testament to as this testament to its very failure to be conceived. Zizek's critique of Western Buddhism, therefore, has much less to do with the teachings of the Buddha than he has made it seem, and significantly more to do with the mystical feminine jouissance it suggests, which this feminine jouissance seems to be beyond, and for that reason, threatening to Zizek. My answer... Far from the feminine jouissance, enjoyment, to be something threatening for me, uh, something I try to keep at a distance, the feminine jouissance is not beyond the traumatic act of sexual difference, but one of its aspects. It emerges as the immanent other side of the feminine, of, sorry, of the phallic domain. The very formulation, mystical feminine jouissance, is misleading. As Lacan points out, mysticism is not exclusively feminine. Apart from its feminine version, Saint Teresa, we also have its masculine version, John of the Cross. And I want especially to insist on this difference, uh, uh, masculine mystical jouissance, 
Lacan did something interesting here. He went to actually read this mystics for, from early modernity, St. Teresa versus John of the Cross, and discovered that although they seem to describe the same mystical experience, John of the Cross gives it a masculine, perverse reading. For him, a mystical experience means that I identify with the gaze, the eye of the God looking at me. I am directly an object in and of the other. This is the perverse self-objectivization. But St. Teresa, read her, I did. St. Teresa is, in the best sense of the term, purely hysterical. St. Teresa, if anything, goes on talking, improvises, talks too much, and so on and so on. And as such, is much closer to an authentic feminine position because St. Teresa precisely never reaches or forever postpones this so-called mystical piece of fully swimming in the divine enjoyment. But next point, the equation of the Buddhist enlightenment with the assertion of the feminine jouissance and with mysticism is unfounded. As my friend Lorenzo Chiesa put it, Buddhism is not a version of mysticism. Buddhism is an inverted mysticism, a quote from Chiesa's manuscript. Unlike Eastern polytheisms and their stress on enjoyment, Buddhism is a religion of desire, but it organizes desire in a way that is very different from that of Judeo-Christianity. More precisely, Buddhism short-circuits all the variations of desire, as polydesire, we might add, which appear in it in a most incarnate fashion with the ultimate apprehension of the radically illusory character of all desire. End of quote. So the formula of Buddhism would thus be not the mystical one with the world, my immersion into the divine one, bringing full enjoyment, but the none with the world. I identify the void of my inexistence, the nothingness of myself, with the void of reality itself, which lacks any substantial identity. Why mysticism aims at the subject's full immersion into divine jouissance, Buddhism focuses on desire as the ultimate cause of our suffering. Desire is inconsistent, it cannot ever be fulfilled, fully satisfied, because its nature is inconsistent. Since its object is illusory, the false appearance of a void, the moment of desire's fulfillment is the moment of its defeat. And Buddhism draws the radical consequence from this insight. Not only, the only way to avoid suffering is to step out of, or rather to gain distance towards the will of desire, to avoid attachment to any object of desire, which means to accept, not only as a theoretical statement, but also as an existential stance, that desires are illusory because all objects of desire are non-substantial, fluctuating appearances. Such an existential detachment is the only way for us to attain peace. For Lacan, to put it brutally, such a detachment is a fake. Desire is from Lacan in itself pathological. A pathological excess, a destabilization of any balanced natural order. 
Suzuki seems to imply that what makes a desire mortifying is its intellectualization, its submission to rational categories that reify the fluid life experience of reality into a world of fixed substantial objects. However, desire is at its basic not an effect of mechanic intellectual imprisonment. It is a deviation inscribed into life itself. In other words, if we subtract desire from life, we don't get a more balanced life, we lose life itself. To put it succinctly, Buddhism celebrates the stepping out of the wheel of desire, while Lacan celebrates the subject's very fall into this wheel. Not compromising one's desire means a radical subjective engagement in a crazy desire, which, which uh, throws our entire reality out of balance. I will now repeat a quote, which I already use in my books, to make this clear, a uh, well-known quote from Neil Gaiman. Longer quote, but I love it. Have you ever been in love? Horrible, isn't it? It makes you so vulnerable. It opens your chest and it opens up your heart. And it means that someone can get inside you and mess you up. You build up all these defenses. You build up a whole suite of suit of armor so that nothing can hurt you. Then one stupid pers person, no different from any other stupid person, wanders into your stupid life. You give them a piece of you. They didn't ask for it. They did something dumb one day, like kiss you or smile at you, and then your life isn't your own anymore. Love takes hostages. It gets inside you. It eats you out and leaves you crying in the darkness. So simple a phrase like, maybe we should be just friends, turns into a glass splinter working its way into your heart. It hurts, not just in the imagination, not just in the mind. It's a soul hurt, a real gets inside you and rips you apart pain. I hate love. End of quote. And here is then the difference. Buddhism teaches us to relieve us of this soul hurt. Psychoanalysis compels us to fully embrace it. Or as Lacan put it, the highest moral law is the law of desire. Now, this brings me back to what already I improvised a little bit yesterday. The difference between two main versions of Buddhism, Mahayana, the big will, and Theravada. Theravada returns partially to the original uh, uh, Hinayana Buddhism. It concerns the accessibility of Nirvana, which makes the subject uh, so-called Bodhisattva, the enlightened, awakened one. In Theravada, which predominates in Tibet, Encountering somebody who already is a Buddha is needed to truly make someone a Bodhisattva. Any other resolution to become Buddha may easily be forgotten or abandoned during the long time ahead. Theravada thus holds that the Bodhisattva path is only for a rare set of individuals and has to be transmitted through exclusive lineage. In contrast to Mahayanaists who universalize the Bodhisattva Yana, being a Bodhisattva, as a path which is open to everyone and is taught for all beings to follow. But here I think problems begin. To maintain this universality, 
The Mahayana tradition has to introduce a distinction between two different notions of a Bodhisattva's relationship to Nirvana. Nirvana, inner peace, rejoining the eternal void, and Bodhisattva, again, the enlightened one. The basic goal is to become, I use the ancient term, Arhat, the one who is worthy, a protected person, the one who has gained insight into the true nature of existence and has achieved Nirvana. The Arhat, having freed himself from the bonds of desire, will not be reborn. While the state of an Arhat is considered in the Theravada tradition to be the proper goal of Buddhism, Mahayana adds to it another level. In Mahayana, we obtain the distinction between two kinds of Nirvana. The Nirvana of an Arhat and a superior type of Nirvana called a uh, Apratistita, non-abiding. This second type of nirvana allows a Buddha to remain engaged in our ordinary life, the will of desire, without being affected by its traps. However, the predominant Mahayana notion of Bodhisattva silently concedes that to arrive at such a non-dual state, in the sense of, yes, I am in the void, but I remain fully in the reality. I just relate in a different way to the same flux of reality. They admit that this is practically impossible. So, here enters the notion of bodhisattva in its specific Mahayana meaning. Bodhisattva is somebody who heroically sacrifices his, they are mostly men, his own dharma and postpones his awakening until all living beings will be liberated. Bodhisattvas take the following vow. I shall not enter into final nirvana before all beings will have been liberated or I must lead all beings to liberation. I will stay here till the end, even for the sake of one's living soul. End of quote. The Bodhisattva who wants to reach Buddhahood, becoming Buddha, for the sake of all beings, is more loving and compassionate than the Srapaka. He who only wishes to end his or her or its own suffering. Uh, the true Bodhisattva practices the path of the good of others, par arta, while the Sravakas do so for their own good, sub arta. I find this distinction between par arta and sub arta potentially very dangerous. Although Mahayana appears more democratic, allowing everyone to attain Dharma, enter Nirvana, does this notion of Bodhisattva, who refuses to enter Nirvana, does it not conceal a new form of elitism? A selected few who remain caught into our ordinary reality in the will of desire, legitimize their special privileged position by the fact that they could have reached nirvana but postpone it to help all others to reach it. In some radical sense, nirvana thus becomes impossible, out of reach. If I reach it, I act as an egotist. I care only for my own good because I reach it alone in inner reflection. If I act for the good of others, again I postpone my entry into nirvana. I consider this privileged position dangerous because it remains caught in a 
dualism that authentic Buddhism promises to leave behind. The realm of nirvana becomes a beyond which we strive to reach. You can reach it, but alone. And if you do this, it's a kind of uh, paradox that your position of enunciation undermines the content. You reach nirvana, but you as you alone, which precisely asserts your ego. The danger resides in the fact that this position relies on what one could call the basic syllogism of self-sacrifice. I want all living beings to overcome their suffering and achieve the supreme good. To do this, I have to sacrifice my own happiness and accept suffering. Only in this way, my own life has meaning. Again, the danger is that a short circuit necessarily occurs here. I automatically take my own suffering as a proof that I am working for the good of others, so that I can reply to anyone who criticizes me. Can't you see my suffering? Who are you to criticize me when I sacrifice myself for you? At this point, happiness and sacrifice are no longer opposed. They fully coincide. What brings me, if I am the Mahayana type uh, Bodhisattva, who remains in this world of suffering to help others, what brings me happiness in the sense of libidinal satisfaction is the very pain of my sacrifice, which I misread as a proof that my life has a deeper meaning. This is why the only authentic nirvana means that I fully remain in this world and just relate to it differently. Non-abiding nirvana is the only full and true nirvana. So where does, why does even this nirvana, I think, fail? Let me focus on another problem that I briefly mentioned yesterday, uh, the dimension of intersubjectivity, in the basic sense of uh, collectivity, you as part of a group of humanity or other people and so on. Uh, in her text, Relational Dharma, Janine Davis, tries to develop a liberating model of intersubjectivity. Her starting point is the basic goal of practicing Dharma, which is precisely to, uh, to, to reach, to drown yourself in this interrelational totality. Davis, of course, has to concede that the practice of meditation is primarily focused on solitary introspective methods, where stages of insight unfold with a climate of extreme mental seclusion and interpersonal isolation. Her aim is to demonstrate how dharma can also be achieved through new social practice of interaction. In order to deploy this claim, she engages in the opposition between, again, two main orientations of Buddhism, Mahayana and Theravada. As I already said, Theravada concentrates on achieving Dharma by means of individual practice of introspection, while Mahayana emphasizes Dharma achieved by social interaction. Say, when an individual is afflicted by a trauma, which threatens to destroy his, her, that psychic balance and ability to interact with others, Mahayana practices the relational dharma approach which, a quote, mediates and attunes within an environment of emphatic union 
nourishing an atmosphere that assuages anxiety and facilitates the generation of trust and safety to flow in the in-between. This process allows for the possibility of transforming negative or life-diminishing filters into associations that widen and deepen identity. In this experience, the appearance of something foreign, not part of or too much, is relaxed so that one's desire of what constitutes a whole person naturally broadens and evolves and a deeper understanding of oneself and the relationship between oneself and others emerges." End of quote. So in such an approach, one achieves, again, quote, the inner liberty to feel another's suffering as inseparable to one's own, and the compassion to seek to alleviate it, thus respecting the freedom of others as inseparable to one's own freedom. The freedom to forgive others and their transgressions. In order to forgive, the ability to step back and recognize the conditions of uh, and recognize the conditions, sorry, that gave rise to his or her or their actions versus reacting from a place of personalizing these actions must be develop as awareness into the causal relationship, relationship that led this individual to be wounded and act in a harmful way becomes recognized, relational objectivity emerges and compassion becomes possible. So I think to cut a long story short that nice as it may sound, this operation doesn't work. Why? Because it simply applies the, it simply applies the notion of, uh, the notion of uh, 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 interrelatedness. There are no things, objects alone. Uh, it's all part of a generalized flux to intersubjectivity. The idea is that you are evil if you extract yourself from the totality of human beings and posit yourself as an exception, you tend to dominate others, and so on. If you see the whole pattern, then obstacles to freedom do not simply vanish, but they are re-experienced as vehicles for growth and freedom. They are deprived of their substantial identity and put in their relational context in which they arise and disappear into dependence, resonating, uh, sorry, resonating within the whole, whole like totality. But my problem is here, it's a very naive approach, and I would like to hear an answer. And I know that some Buddhists heroically try to practice it. Imagine you are in a political, not political, violent political struggle, demonstration. Police is beating you. I know of some heroic uh, uh, Buddhists from... Uh, Myanmar, ex Burma, the colonial term, who, when they were attacked by the police and ar army soldiers who tried to suppress their uh, protest, they didn't fight back, but they heroically accepted those and addressed the soldiers, like, don't you see? This is all a flux of phenomena. We are part of the same totality. If you realize this, you will see how all things that you are doing, evil things, 
in some mysterious way contributes to global harmony and so on and so on. Okay, you can imagine where I am aiming at something more brutal. What I was talking about yesterday. Would you say this to Himmler or to some concentration camp executioners? Uh, that uh, we will not fight you, we just, we prisoners in outreach or whatever, we just have to re-experience you as vehicles for growth and freedom. I don't think that when we are dealing with the evil that I tried to explain yesterday, that such a stance of unearthing the, the relational context helps at all. I think that it's some kind of a fake, empty wisdom. It doesn't work. Why not? Now I come to my uh, second point. Because, as I again already uh, pointed out yesterday, because of the problem of intersubjectivity. Because intersubjectivity, from the Hegelian and Lacanian standpoint, is a cut in reality. As, an, as a subject, I extract myself from a... I extract myself from a totality, and for me, another person that I encounter is and forever remains an enigma. And Lacan uses the Italian term from some old play, che vuoi? What do you want? To recognize another person means precisely not to resolve him, her, them into the flux of America, but respect them in their in the abyss of their uniqueness, which can also be uh, uh, which can also be evil. So uh, for uh, Lacan, inter 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 subjectivity is irreducibly conflictual in the sense that inter if I were to be alone without intersubjectivity. But I'm not, of course, because I'm constituted through relations to others. I could say, okay, I try to dominate reality, I never succeed, and so on. But as Hegel saw it clearly, the problem is that I am a subject only through struggle, tension with other subjects. Here enters the problem of recognition. And this problem is not so easily uh, uh, resolved through mutual recognition. Uh, why not? Let me make improvise a brief detour through uh, political uh, 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 to, uh, to, through political uh, uh, what I call problem political correctness. The impression I get from many of those who see, and they are there, I admit it, traces of sex, sexual exploitation, domination, and so on, implicitly, they talk or even act as if each of us has some kind of inner true desire, sexual desire, motive, reasons, what you want, and this is thwarted for external reasons. Uh, uh, binary, uh, uh, heterosexual logic imposed by the patriarchal order, and so on and so on. So that if we try to get rid of this external imposed ideology, then we would be able to actualize our unique desire. 
But as Lacan puts it, our desire is the desire of the other. Our desire is always mediated by the desires of the others. And as I developed it long ago, in at least three ways. First, my desire is the desire to be desired by others. Second, my desire is the desire of the other, of the big other, in the sense that all that I desire, even if my desire is transgressive one against the ruling ideology and so on, is nonetheless structured, emerges against the background of the predominant symbolic order. And third point, which I already mentioned, uh, my desire for Lacan is triggered by the enigma of the other. The original question of desire is not this is a beautiful scene reconstructed by Lacan and his pupil Jean Laplanche. The original scene of desire, if you want, is not what do I want, what do I desire, I never get what I want, is that already as a small, very small baby, I notice that I am caught in the network of the desire of the others. My parents, relatives, brother, sister, they see something in me, they want something from me. And it's never clear to me, it remains an enigma, what do they want from me? And I don't think that this enigmatic complexity can be resolved in, in dissolving myself, as it were, in the... Uh, in the in the in the inter in the interrelational flow of phenomena, so that I see I'm part of a larger uh, society, of oh, sorry, of a larger network where all phenomena are coordinated, and so on and so on. I think that there is, at least as I see it, no place in at least the Buddhism that I know, that I've read, no place for this radical notion of intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity is mostly about how to overcome uh, my egotism. But as a subject, and that was my point yesterday when I talk about Himmler, the worst Dominating subjects are precisely those who do not identify with their egotism, but who are ready to sacrifice themselves, their lives, everything for the evil cause, which is their cause, for which they are precisely ready to sacrifice everything. So let me slowly approach the conclusion First, by pointing to one crucial thing. When Buddhists talk about this inner experience of withdrawing from external reality, reaching inner peace, withdrawing into yourself, the point is not that there is no such a thing. But I, I think that Hegel does allow for something that echoes the practice of meditation, which in Theravada Buddhism is primarily focused on solitary introspective methods where stages of insight unfold within a climate of extreme mental seclusion and interpersonal isolation. However, while in Buddhism, through such practice, the mind experiences a kind of current of quiet peace, for Hegel, introspection confronts us with an awful space in which ghastly apparitions of partial objects float around. Here is the most famous and often quoted passage 
passage of this night of the world that I quote again. The human being is this night, this empty nothing that contains everything in its simplicity, an unending wealth of many representations, images of which none belongs to the human being or which are not present. This night, the interior of nature that exists here in pure self is in phantasmagorical representation, is night all around it, in which here shoots a bloody head, there another white ghastly apparition, suddenly here before it and just so disappears. One catches sight of this night when one looks human beings into the eye, into a night that becomes awful. So you see what Hegel provides here. Also, a state where all stable identities dissolve, but not in a peaceful flow, but in what Lacan would have called the experience of corps, le corps morcelé, dismembered body, a, a terrifying mixture of ghastly apparitions. And this topic, now to conclude, this topic brings us back to the notion of sacrifice. We have seen what kind of sacrifice the notion of bodhisattva implies. This sacrifice remains firmly within the frame of traditional sacrifice. I choose to remain in the Valley of Tears, postponing my full enlightenment in order to work for the global elimination of suffering. It's like, sorry for this tasteless metaphor, let's say I am a rich guy, billionaire, but oh, I move, uh, I move to a ghetto among the poor and sacrifice, give most of my wealth to them there to, to also help them, to bring them to wealth. So Buddhist enlightenment implies a self-reflexive sacrifice. You empty yourself of your desires, the poor sweet of which always disappoints you, and in a way you sacrifice this sacrifice itself, because after you sacrifice your desires and their satisfaction, you realize that what you sacrificed was in itself uh, worthless. So, an authentic, here nonetheless, let me conclude with this, the uh, Buddhism and Lacan come very close because they both agree that an authentic sacrifice functions as a gesture of total self-renunciation. Now the quotes are from Haha, the one who is close to Buddhism, but at the same time totally different. My favorite theologist, Seren Kierkegaard. In self-renunciation, one understands one is capable of nothing. So in theological terms, the renunciation bears witness to the total gap that separates man from God. The only way to assert one's commitment to unconditional meaning of life is to relate all of your life, your entire existence, to the absolute transcendence of the divine, and since there is no common measure between our life and the divine, the sacrificial renunciation cannot be part of an exchange with God. We sacrifice all the totality of our life for nothing. Quote from Kierkegaard. The contradiction which arrests the understanding is that of a man uh, 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 required to make the greatest possible sacrifice to dedicate his whole life as a sacrifice and wherefore there is indeed no wherefore, end of quote. What this means is that there is no guarantee that our sacrifice will be rewarded, that it will restitute meaning to our life. 
One has to make a leap of faith, which, in the eyes of an external observer, cannot but appear as an act of madness, like Abraham's readiness to kill Isaac. Even to many of my Jewish friends, this is problematic. Uh, through my Jewish friends, I learned that some more progressive-oriented Jewish, let's call them, I don't like the term theologist, try to get rid of that moment. They claim that Isaac rebelled, that what we get is a later rewriting of the, of the, of the, uh, of the old Jewish uh, testament. That, yes, uh, uh, God did ask Abraham to kill Isaac, but Abraham rejected it. That all others is, and that in, then God acknowledged this. Now you are my true follower. I think it's too easy this way out. Again, a quote from Kierkegaard. At first glance, the understanding ascertains that this is madness. The understanding asks, what's in it for me? The answer is nothing. So the ultimate meaning of sacrifice is therefore the sacrifice of meaning itself. Now, if you allow me just to go on a little bit to a topic which is actual today. So the only true radical opposition is the one between Buddhism for me and Lacan's formulation of psychoanalytic ethics. They are both not anti-scientific. They accept that scientific achievements cannot be reintegrated into our daily experiences. I will refer here to a German neuroscientist who put this very nicely. Thomas Metzinger uh, uh, claimed in his great book, Being No One, that we cannot help experiencing ourselves as selves, substantial, subjective identities. We can learn rationally that there is no self, that we are biogenetically determined, self-replicating mechanisms. We can accept this at the level of abstract knowledge. But we cannot believe in it in the sense of really assuming it as a subjective experience. As I de already developed years ago, there are within uh, brain sciences themselves different versions here. The first one is this one mentioned here by Metzinger, a gap. We are you know, in the same way, vaguely familiar to Louis Althusser, who said there is a gap between scientific knowledge and our ideological self-experience. Our ideological self-experience is here to stay. We cannot get rid of it, but it's in some sense an illusion. So we have to live in this gap. I know scientifically that I am totally self-determined, that my freedom is a subjective illusion, but nonetheless, I cannot ex but experience myself as a free human being with a autonomous will and so on and so on. Then there are those like Patricia Churchland who think that, but I don't believe it can be done, who think that they can that people will be able to do it. That in the same way that now, when you look at the moon and see it as a small ball or even circle in the sky, we all know that moon is a large planet, that we can do something similar in our experience and act with full awareness that there is no free will. This will even make as able to construct maybe a more tolerant and so on society. Then there is the transcendental solution, which I talked about a lot in the past. 
the idea elaborated by neo Hegelians uh, like from Pippin to uh, Robert Brandom up to Habermas and others in Germany, claiming that uh, even I when we investigate our brains in neural sciences and treat our brains as another natural mechanism, our very scientific activity is done in such a way that we perceive ourselves as practicing free reasoning. For example, now, if I were to be a, a, a determinist neuroscientist, I'm trying, I argue, I'm trying to convince you by arguments that there is no free will. Well, if there is no free will, why am I trying even to convince you? When I'm trying to convince you, I treat you minimally as a free person to be convinced by arguments. And then what comes is a fourth solution. What do I mean by this? Uh, recall the practice of many lonely, even not so lonely individuals. The, my friends are among them, who in the evenings mostly chat extensively with the chatbot, exchanging friendly messages about new movies and books, debating political questions and so on. No wonder that such exchanges are relaxing and satisfying. To use my old joke, what they get, my friends, is an artificial intelligence version of decaffeinated coffee or drink without sugar, a neighbor without its opaque monstrosity, an other who simply accommodates itself to my needs. But there is a lie at work here. A chatbot lies most when it openly confesses that it is just a machine. Like, I made this experiment. I asked a chatbot a week ago a simple question. Should I be a communist? And haha, the answer I got is, listen, as an artificial intelligence language model, I do not have personal opinions or beliefs, and I cannot make decisions for you. Ultimately, the decision to adopt a particular political ideology, such as communism, is a personal one that should be based on careful consideration and evaluation of the ideology's principles, values, and potential outcomes, and so on. Why is this a lie? It is true as to its enunciated. Effectively, we are dealing with a digital machine which doesn't have opinions. But it is a lie as to its implicit position of enunciation. A chatbot talks as if it is a real person just frankly admitting to its limitation and confessing it is not a real person. The mystification is here the opposite of the fetishist denial. The chatbot denies nothing. It's just said, I know I am not a real person. But the but is that it continues to speak, to argue as if it is a real person. But back to Metzinger. He goes here a step further. There is one caveat that he allows, precisely as you may have guessed, the Buddhist enlightenment, in which the self directly, experientially assumes his own non-being recognizes itself as a simulated self, a representational fiction. Such a, a situation in which we became lucid to oneself, uh, Metzinger claims, directly 
corresponds to the Buddhist conception of enlightenment. When I'm enlightened through meditation, Buddhist meditation, what I arrive at is no longer self-awareness. It is no longer I, myself, who experiences myself as the agent of my thoughts. My awareness is the direct awareness of a selfless system, a selfless knowledge. In short, there effectively is a link, a kind of asymptotic point of coincidence between the radical brain sciences positions and the Buddhist idea of an Atman, Atman self of the self's in existence. The Buddhist subjective stance of Anatman is the only subjective stance which really assumes the result of uh, 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 cognitivism, of brain sciences, and which in certain versions is fully compatible with radical scientific uh, naturalism. But it is here that we clearly see, sorry, where, how, although Lacan defines the Freudian subject as the subject of modern science, how this proximity only makes the gap more palpable. In Buddhism, you are taught to sacrifice desire in order to attain the inner peace of enlightenment in which sacrifice cancels itself. You sacrifice in the course of meditation everything, but then you discover the, the worthlessness of what you sacrifice. For Lacan, however, that's the formula with which I want to finish, the true sacrifice is not sacrificing your desire. No. We often sacrifice our desire to make it easier for us. Sacri uh, desire is hell, as I try to demonstrate with that quote from Neil Gaiman. The true sacrifice is desire itself. Desire is an intrusion which throws off the rail, the rhythm of my daily life. It compels me to forfeit everyday pleasures and comforts for discipline and hard work in the pursuit of the object of my desire, be it love, a political cause, science, or whatsoever. So again, with great appreciation for Buddhism, they are both aware of this radical dimension of sacrifice, sacrifice of sacrifice itself. But for Buddhism, it is sacrifice of desire for Lacan, desire itself is already a sacrifice. You sacrifice the peace, the peaceful flow of your life for the cause object of your desire. That's the big choice to be made. Sorry if I was a little bit too long. Thanks very much. Okay, First, just to emphasize this, negative dialectics is a precise term introduced by Adorno. And when I speak about negativity, I don't mean that negative dialectics. The whole frame of Adorno, which goes in the, that with Hegel, you have all the negation, but at the end it serves positive reason and so on. Uh, uh, they are... Uh, 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 I think this is a wrong reading of Hegel. But let me go on with this posit and so on, positivity and so on, Deleuze. Uh, uh. First, this link is established by some of my Buddhist critics themselves. And in an abstract sense, I think they are right. I think that the reading of Buddhism as a negative experience. Negative in the sense of you renounce reality, you, you enter another higher spiritual domain and so on, is precisely a wrong reading of uh, authentic Buddhism. I believe in such a thing as authentic Buddhism. You know, we already project, I think, 
our Western notion of transcendence as higher spiritual experience, there is another realm and so on into Buddhism. No, they are right, those of my critics, where they claim that Buddhism just phenomenalizes the world, inclusive of ourselves, deprives all objects of their substantial identity. And for a radical Buddhist, this idea of spiritual discipline, where you exempt yourself from external reality, is precisely the, the worst egotism. It's precisely you exempt yourself as something unique. So again, as I quote this in some of my books, I forgot which one, I think less than nothing. There is, for example, a, a Japanese friend uh, draw my attention to it. And I forgot his name, a radical Japanese Buddhist from the 20th, early 20th century, who read Buddhist experience, not as detaching yourself from the world, but as pure immanence from, for a true Buddhist. When you try to dominate the world, you do this always from this distance, Cartesian distance. I am here at a distance. Reality is out there waiting for me to be dominated, mediated by my concepts and so on and so on. Buddhism means, on the contrary, full immersion into the world. It tries to abolish the gap. But I think that precisely this gap is uh, irreducible. So my position is not that of absolute immanence. This is the position, not so much of Buddhism, but most of the Lewis. And some, I had a friendly conflict once with Giorgio Agamben about this. Agamben claimed that, you know, the Lesian way, that every image of transcendence is an illusory projection of immanence. Something is wrong here immanently, and you, to account for this, you project it into an external cause. That's also basically, uh, uh, that's why Deleuze likes Spinoza, Spinoza's notion of God. Not God as nature, but God as the personal transcendent God. So uh, what I think is not that there is another transcendent reality. I try to find a third way here. Not pure immanence and not everything that we experience is obviously not all there is. But this doesn't mean that there is somewhere else a higher reality. It means just that there is a gap of this reality, that this reality has a gap, is inconsistent, and so on. That would be my simple answer, that we have to undermine this very uh, opposition between immanence and transcendence. And some Tibetan friends, this may interest you, claim to me that there is a dark undercurrent, even in Buddhist experience, where what needs to be done is done, which means that nirvana is not conceived as a state of eternal peace, but an incredibly, at the same time, an incredibly brutal, unbearable tension. They almost speak like those European mystics that I like, from Meister Eckhart to Jakob Beme, who talk about an endless self-division and pain in God himself. So the, the true gap is not between God and man, but within God itself. And you know what was my nice surprise? We all know those, for me at least, I thought this is my European Eurocentric uh, uh, misperception. If you uh, listen to those dark dark uh, uh, 
Tibetan Buddhist uh, instrumental pieces, oh, those trumpets and basses. And my idea was also, screw it, this is not a sublime experience. This is the atmosphere. And they told me, yes, it is. Ah, if this is true, that I'm for Buddhism. I just want to, to put it in very Eurocentric terms, to posit the origin of evil split and so on into the very heart of so-called divinity itself. There already things go wrong. Okay. Um, can I bring Lawrence in? I'm going to try making presenter. I don't know if that opens okay. the mic. If it works. Yeah. He's got a question about Greco-Buddhism. Are you able to speak, Lord? Uh, uh, it sounds interesting because I didn't hear about I'm it. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you yeah, hear me? I do. <laughs> no, hello, I do. hello. Thank you so much. Um, I've been trying to revise this question as you were speaking because you were touching on it then. Um, uh, you mentioned it as a Eurocentric answer, and I was sort of touching on the notion of Greco Buddhism and how. Uh, what is Greco Buddhism? Teach me, please. I don't well, know. I'm an idiot here. Well, you know, after Alexander the Great, uh, you know, found his way ah, towards the uh -huh. Indus or whatever, he left a diaspora of people. And uh, they sort of ended up being kind of a solvent almost for uh, early Buddhist missionaries. Uh, so they sort of carried with them a Hellenic influence, you know, and uh, had Hellenic artwork and iconography. But then... Uh, Where did this take place? In India or in Greece In, Bacta in Bactaria, so Afghanistan, modern-day Afghanistan. Oh, my um, God, that's interesting. Yes, go on, please. Yeah, yes. And um, they, in, through this sort of process of osmosis, for instance, one of the first uh, Buddhist missionaries to China who then kind of led on to Zen Buddhism, was a Greek, uh, ethnic, ethnic Greek Buddhist from Afghanistan who was, you know, uh, you know, left by in the diaspora. Yeah. And um, there, around this time, uh, Greek sculpture art came to uh, into contact with India. And in India at this time, uh, the Buddhists weren't representing the Buddha in a pictorial form in any of their artwork. And it's argued that it was this influence of the Greeks with their notion of form and, you know, sculpture who sort of convinced the uh, the Buddhists that they might want to stop, you know, employing this as an ideological tool or, you know, as a... So are you just empirically claiming it's very interesting that all these wonderful statues, Buddha uh, uh, sitting down mm -hmm. with this benevolent smile, that this came after the Greek influence? Yes, this is what it's argued for. And, um, uh, for instance, in Afghanistan, the... Uh, those two huge statues of the Buddha that were exploded by the Taliban in 2004, yeah. I think it was. Inside yeah, yeah. of them, you, you could you could uh, get inside of them and um, a bit like the Statue of Liberty, and they contain, contained iconography, a Buddhist Buddhist art, Buddhist kind of stories, but uh, in 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 the Greek artistic style. Uh, what interests me a lot about this is this notion of uh, the Greeks talking to uh, the, these Indians about. Uh, this notion of negativity, this notion of not representing your the Buddha, not representing the idol, and how perhaps this uh, this could be one of the early uh, kind of communication points of negative theology. You, you talked, you, you spoke about that term before. Let, but was, wait a minute. Let me clarify something because no. uh, you're confusing me. I why is it not why why? But didn't the Greeks? Precisely do the opposite to to obfuscate the negativity in some sense. Why do yes. you think the Greeks brought negativity? There? Well, no, not so much. I, I think perhaps it was the opposite direction. I believe perhaps the Greeks were moving sculpture and form kind of one way, and perhaps the Eastern thought was moving negativity the other way. And it finds maybe expression in Plotinus or Maimonides. You know, some of these people <laughs> who end up being important in in Judeo Christian thought. And that made me uh, ask the question that whether or not this collapses the distance between Buddhism and psychoanalysis somewhat, given that... Uh... Yeah, but you know what would be my basic point here? That's why I don't like neoplatonics and so on. I think, to put it in very simple terms, that all this... It, I will simplify it to the zero level. All this point of, you know, some original divinity and then you have the fall. 
Mm-hmm. My point in a very simplistic way is that everything begins with the fall. There is nothing before the fall. The mm-hmm. fall retroactively creates what it is the fall from. And I think this came out only with Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. I never, okay. I, uh, if I were to make a choice here, I would, now I will say something horrible. I hope you will get my joke. Please do. That now you almost convinced me the Taliban were right to bomb the steps. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, you know, uh, 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 the negativity should remain pure, but again, the point is what is in negativity? Not because it's too pure a spirituality, a spirituality that we cannot ever approach, but, uh, but because uh, negativity means for me that there is nothing behind it. Buddhism here had the right insight. Nirvana is not uh, uh, like uh, a veil hiding some even higher divinity beyond our representation and so on and so on. There are phenomena and there is nothing behind, beneath whatever the phenomena. My problem is only, is this nothing a peaceful nothing or is this nothing the nothing of a self-split divided horror? I see, I see. Another quick question to add on, thank you for that. Uh, is you mentioned Althusser uh, towards the end, and I'm influenced yeah. a lot by Walter Montag and his uh, take on Althusser. And he... I, 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 you know why I admired uh, Warren Montag? You talk about him. Warren, no? Mm-hmm. Warren yeah. Montag, I, think yeah, I should You know say. why? Because he didn't yet convince me, but I follow his work. He is under... He is observed by my KGB secret agent. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, he tries to do the impossible, and this always fascinates me. Montag tries to bring together, uh, 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 to cut a long story short, the less Althusser and Hegel. He doesn't accept this incompatibility, you know. Yes. That's what I sincerely admire in his work. Mm-hmm. And well, I, well, what I thought was really fascinating and sort of analogous to what you're talking about was how... Um, he describes Althusser's uh, sort of forget, forgetting and remembering of his Judeo-Christian sort of uh, background uh, as a who, early... Whom, whom, whom? Louis Althusser, as he... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is very interesting because you know that it's literally forgetting. Because do you know that Althusser began as a Christian, almost theologist? Mostly. Yes, and he was in, he was getting rejected from Christian journals and wondering wondering why that was. But, but uh... my uh, my Kosovo Kosovo Albanian friend Agon Hamza, I'm sorry, it's not better known. Wrote a thesis precisely on this on Althusserian Christian origins. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fascinating. But just just to round off, it, he. You, because you know what makes me so sad? How Althusser was really like Christ, betrayed practically by all his followers. It began with Ranciere, the lesson of Althusser. Then yes. now I mentioned Althusser the last time I met him years ago to Balibar, and he was quite angry at me. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you link me with that? Why do you reduce that me impression. to that Nazi face and so on? Well, he was even, even denied by himself. He, he, even, he, even, he even rejected himself, did he not? Officer, and said, denied it was his own yeah, work. But and his, was... Although I don't like them for scandalous reasons. Uh, uh, yes. his, his autobiography book. But it's very interesting what he says there about his theory, Althusser. You know that he admits, which is obvious to anyone who read, reads his Lire la Capitale and Four Marx. To cut a long story short, Althusser never read The Capital of Marx in its entirety. He you, believe that. Read, you, believe him, you believe him when he says that. Okay. Absolutely. It's <laughs> clear from the, bring... Okay, you are uh, right, Esther. Uh, let's not lose time. Yeah. Yes, Can but, I bring but, but, My apologies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Lawrence. Can I bring Victoria yeah. in, who's had her hand up for a while? 
Please, yes. Be able to speak. Is she still Victoria? there? Victoria, are you there? No. Okay. Yes, um, in, in the meantime, I've got two questions. So, Casper Dillon asks... Oh, Casper, you, did you want to come in on the microphone? I can try and enable that. Uh, yes, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have a question about the Dalai Lama quotes about happiness, because I yeah. think that they are perhaps not fully... Uh, there's several interpretations, but, but for the first interpretation is that it's not maybe authentic Buddhism, of old, although okay, it's coming from Dalai Lama, but uh, that uh, in a, some sense these quotes are a little bit uh, to, to, let's say, recruit people to Buddhism, but they are not what you will actually get. I had get. the same suspicion. I had, because, you know, I noticed in a couple of his books that it's as if to attract people, yes. he usually begins, not even the main text, the yeah. foreword or whatever. It is, it's, like, it's like saying, guys, don't be afraid. I don't want to spoil your life, you know. But nonetheless, I go here to the end and I claim uh, my definition of life is pursuit of unhappiness. Why do we... This is, and I think I agree with here. If your point is that I can well imagine a certain kind of radical Buddhism which would accept this, that, yeah. that precisely the biggest illusion of our lives of this common wheel of desire logic is not. It's not that we always miss happiness, but. The mistake is already the search for happiness itself. And I can even put it in more Western, uh, John Elster, rational act theory, or even in Hegelian terms, that happiness is what some uh, theories of action define as a, a necessary byproduct, in the sense that if you aim at it, you will miss it. If you, it's like dignity. If you ask yourself, I want to act in a dignified life, you will appear an idiot who is desperately trying to act with dignity. So that this is for me the truth of it, that you begin with saying, yeah, yeah, happiness, but then the conclusion should be that the only way to be moderately happy is to do your duty and don't think about happiness. Yeah. Exactly. Even, or even, I don't mean this any high beauty, but listen, to, I go back to my now, to my tasteless example of being in love and so on. Achieving what you want, intense sex with the beloved person and so on. It's very intense, beautiful. But can you really call it happiness? It's something incredibly intense and from the sp standpoint of happiness, the nice moment is afterwards, when you can say, okay, I did it, now I can take a rest. You know what I mean? Here, I think an intelligent, really radical Buddhist would take this, would take this, this path. I tend to, so thanks, I tend to agree with you. And I don't, and uh, this is not an, uh, a criticism of Dalai Lama. I understand him. That's why I talked yesterday, you remember, so much about uh, this uh, uh, showing the tongue and so on, you know. Because what I really worry is that this will be terribly exploited by the enemies of Tibet. Probably the Chinese planted it. We are all aware that Tibetan resistance is embodied in Dalai Lama. If you erase from the picture Dalai Lama, it's, uh, it's over. It's all based on it. So I, 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 I totally agree with you here. Yeah. And I, I even suspect that within this happiness that he says, it's actually suffering hidden as happiness. Because if you go back to the original Buddha, right? The Buddha was someone who was a prince who was happy. And then when he started seeing suffering, he got 
interested in suffering. He got curious about suffering. He started to investigate suffering. And the whole journey of the Buddha is finding the right kind of suffering. But this suffering is called happiness. Like it's precisely distorted that the greatest suffering is, yes. is to be happy or, here, or, or... I get it. With Buddha. But here I would say we are come, they, at least we in the West, I don't know how this economy works within if there is a difference, I don't think there is a difference between our typical and so-called oriental typical psychic attitude. But, you know, for us in the West, celebrating suffering as happiness can also be read in an extremely dangerous totalitarian way. For example, I read a wonderful analysis of the universal international impact of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, especially, uh, 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 especially uh, the last fourth part with those, that song and so on. And uh, it's interesting that even some extreme left-wingers liked it. For example, did you know that Beethoven's Ninth was the only piece of Western classical music that was performed in China, so I read, even in the time of uh, cultural revolution. But at the same time, Japanese were obsessed by it. Uh, so there was even, you can find it, find it on YouTube, I think, a version at the stadium, 10,000 people, or even 100,000, I don't know, singing it. But they like precisely this idea of happiness in suffering, in pain. You know, they give it this, as it were, a totalitarian twist. Yes, there is uh, always pain, suffering in happiness, but still don't identify them in the sense that suffering is in itself the proof of happiness. Because as I quoted that example, many people give their suffering as a proof that they are authentic in some sense, no? So things get complex, you know. Victoria, are you able to come in? I know you've been waiting for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think there is a problem in connection because I hear from right. time to time some moaning. <laughs> okay, while, while, we, while we wait, I'll put I'm so this... sorry. My apologies, Victoria, if you hear me. Yeah, I'll put a question from the chat. Fabian Lawrence says, isn't there a notion in Buddhism where true X, love, etc., can only emerge through incessant practice? In a way, the gap is always there, but it is mediated through practice, not intellectually. What do you think of that? Uh, I see what this is aiming at, but I'm just afraid. Now I try to be anti-Eurocentric, you know, because for uh, 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 but I, uh, I think if there is a great thing in Buddhism, it is precisely that it opposes this typical Western logic of the goal as something out there, difficult to access, you are never there, and so on, and so on. That's why I quoted this in one of my books. I uh, read a wonderful, from a Tibetan Buddhist, critique of the Western obsession with Buddhism. We talked about Kit, about that uh, Brad Pitt movie, Seven Years in Tibet, or what. And he the form of the movie is a fake because insofar as Buddhism, uh, sorry, Tibet is presented as an authentic country and so on, it's something that you have to, difficult to reach across Himalaya, it's out there hidden, you know. And he said that this is, my Tibetan friend, that this is a total fake for them, ultimate wisdom, it's not something out there you are never sure you can reach it or not. This idea of hard road to paradise or whatever, it's very foreign to them. This is also 
opposite already to Buddha's insight. His point, maybe even not so good, was never, so let's radically change society. No, it's always you have to change. Don't go into external causes and so on and so on. So that's, maybe I misunderstand it and don't know enough about it. But uh, I think that the more proper Buddhist answer, even authentic, would have been, okay, we are never there. We approach it endlessly. But then, in some sense, you have to add that. But this path towards the ideal already is the ideal. Don't expect any big change at the end. This uh, echoes in some way, I cannot elaborate it now, even with Hegel's big formula from Phenomenology of Spirit, how truth equals the path towards truth. Truth is not something elusive that you are trying to arrive at. That's why, quite logically, this is for me the key to Hegel. At the end of Hegel's logic, you think you will get some up ultimate, adequate, absolute idea. No. What you get is just the description of the path, a kind of a method. This, Lenin was already fascinated by this. Lenin admits in his philosophical notes or what that he was afraid that you will get some ultimate bullshit at the end of logic, you know. But no, you get just that, the description of a procedure. So the ultimate, again, Buddhist point is to see that you think you are still on the way, but you are in reality already there. That's all I can say now. <laughs> um, F.A. Arbus has, has made a point. So to clarify the notion of Buddhism as pure immanence, how is this reconcilable with sunyata, absolute nothingness? I believe Suzuki suggested that absolute nothingness is the true nature of all things and the ultimate reality. And it seems to be that this is something of a transcendental category since it has to be it's understood not. relatively. Here I agree with precisely Suzuki that I quoted. This, I think, is uh, close to uh, probably Western misreading of Buddhism because we have this gap immanence, transcendence, and then, you know, even if it's nothing, there's something beyond. I am tempted to be more convinced by passages that I quoted from Suzuki, from that guy, Clark and so on, John Clark and so on, that uh, nothingness is the very... Nothingness means no absolute substance entity. There is no ultimate ground, and so on. There is no foundation of it. Nothing link means the, that we have this uh, interrelational flux of phenomena, and they are the only reality we have. So that I, I think it would be very nice to read nothingness as, ah, Victoria is now here. Sorry. Can you get, or I will read, but back to answering this question, nothingness is, for me, the, how should I put it, the nothingness of immanence itself. It's that, it's this phenomenon, that phenomenon, and there is no ultimate ground. The nothingness is the ground in which every, you know who already knew this in Europe, in totally different contexts. Mlad and Dollar, uh, 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 and some French guys also wrote about this, readers of Democritus. When Democritus speaks about nothingness and atoms, for Hegel knew this, we shouldn't read this as empty space and then small balls of atoms dumping there. No, nothingness is the very core of atom. Atom is a form of nothingness. It's, uh, it's, it's much, it gets much more paradoxical here. So it's absolutely crucial, again, not to read, to read nothingness as, as negative category, otherness, transcendence, and so on. 
nothingness and immanence overlap. God sense. Immanence is the immanence of fleeting, non-substantial phenomena. And naturally, you ask, but this phenomena must be grounded in something more stable, deeper. No, they are not, and this is nothingness. In this way, you don't lose phenomena for a higher reality. You accept phenomena as such. I tend to give this reading, which is why, incidentally, Buddhism feels very... Uh, 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 Buddhism, uh, it's not just a fake. It's easy for Buddhism to accept even fake books were written, uh, New Age bullshit. But nonetheless, for Buddhists, quantum physics is not a problem. With all this void, which is not an empty void, and so on. I, I'm going to uh, read Victoria's question, and then I will go okay. to Mark Hume Chum. My so, apologies so, to her, my God, yes. Okay, so it's a long question. So Lawrence laid the ground for the first part of the question. In your new research, have you run across possible routes for Lacan in Eastern philosophy? I mean, philological trails, not just parallels or similarities. Yeah. yeah. After Alexander, there was the Greek to Arabic translation movement then the Arabic to Latin, and by the 1700s we find that John Locke is studying Arabic. Among the German romantics, Schlegel was an expert Arabist, but most relevant here is the 1930s lectures of Koyev in Paris. There we find among the attendees, philosophy, psychoanalysis, Lacan, Henry Corbin, who made widely known... Uh, yeah. We have been Arabist doctrines about the world of imagination and also Andre Breton representing surrealism. Lacan's imaginary seems to owe something to Ibn Arabi, whom Lacan explicitly mentions in one of his seminars. But the question is more about what Euro-American forms these inheritances took, what prevents the law of desire from becoming narcissism, what prevents the rule of law Justice is blind, no respect of persons, from degenerating into an impersonal nightmare. Perfect question, thanks, but it's a question for a new talk, so I will just try to be very short. First, now I will say, as a Lacanian, something critical about Lacan. There is a sad, deplorable aspect of opportunistic behavior in Lacan. When something is in fashion, he tries to refer to it. Like all his flirting with Heidegger in the 50s, and it's the same with uh, the two references that I know to uh, uh, one to Eastern wisdom at the end of his first long foundational decree writing, uh, is the, the uh, place of where in psychoanalysis, his Lacan's so-called uh, uh, report de Rome, report for the Rome meeting where he founded his society. At the very end, if you check it, there is a quote from some in India ancient, I don't know if it's Buddhist or Hinduist, you know, writing. I think he was flirting there. He simply opportunistically referred to it, like Lacan, you know, when then structuralism was fashionable, he proclaimed himself a structuralist, and so on, and so on. As for, I don't, uh, I am now, as for mediation of Arabic, I, uh, the key person, is, I forgot his name, I'm old and senile, isn't there now a, uh, Iranian philosopher from 16th century, John Kobzak is now writing a book on him already for years, who is now rediscovered as a mega figure. Mullah Sadra, yeah, 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 he. But I don't think he can be in any way reappropriated or re into simply the Oriental tradition. I think that the danger with Arabs is to reduce them to intermediary figure. For example, this is a shock. The most uh, racist notion of Arab, of 
Islam, Arabs generally, it's not the same, I know. You find it in Claude Levi Strauss, I think, Le Tris Tropique, where he has an incredible outburst at the beginning, I think, introduction of anti Arabism. He makes such a horrible pagan sexual comparison. He says, East and West, Western Christianity, Judaism, whatever, and Eastern spirituality would be an ideal couple. Well, rational and irrational, masculine and feminine form a beautiful, harmonious totality. But then these fucking Arabs enter with their Islam, and they tend to represent the West for the East, because Eastern people often learn about the West from Muslims, and they tend to represent for us in the West the East. They are, this makes, for me, the Arab Muslims rather sympathetic figures, you know. So, uh, my, uh, my point is I am not yet spiritually addicted to be able to formulate it. But my point would have been Arabs are definitely not just mediators, even when they appear to be. For example, the Hayat proof, uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas, you know that when he says philosopher, he means Aristotle. No, he doesn't even name him. And when, you know, when he argued in this legal form, for and, uh, yeah, 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 Avicenna, that's what I wanted to say. And uh, when he means Avicenna, he says commentator, I think. Commentator as such, you know. So again, uh, 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 things happen there, but unfortunately, I haven't yet, to use my tasteless metaphor from yesterday, I haven't yet a ball pleasure to crack that net, not to say more. Well, I've written something about Islam which deeply fascinates me because everybody today uh, 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 dismisses uh, Islamic community, UMA, as proto-totalitarian, ISIS, and so on. No, but originally it was something fascinating. It was a community of fatherless orphans. There are wonderful books that I read by progressive Islamists. They are privately even not religious. About how crucial it is for Islam, uh, orphan, a uh, father like the origin of Muslims is how is he called that guy black who was abandoned by who 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 is the origin of of uh, 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 that uh, Atwood novel uh, 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 which great figure Bilal yeah. yeah yeah I mean the first wife Nof Sarah who was just a slave his son she was uh, then ejected. And her son alone was supposed to be the beginning of it. And even Mohammed himself, he was an orphan, abandoned by and so on. So that is a paradox. Usually Islam is identified as the greatest uh, religion of patriarchy, but it's more ambiguous. You know, the crucial role, why you read their sacred texts when Mohammed got his visions? He first thought this is the devil. And then his first wife confirmed it. No Islam without Muhammad's wife, who told him, uh, who told him, trust this. This is, it's a more perverse entire scene, but trust him. So uh, uh, Islam is, again, a much more complex thing. Don't reduce it to, I think, I think because of, precisely because of this political investment of Islam, we don't, uh, we are not yet ready to approach it. The last thing, narcissistic desire and so on, in my sense, I may be wrong, but in my sense, and I wonder if you agree or not, in my Lacanian sense, desire and narcissism are mutually exclusive. Desire is never narcissistic. Desire throws you out of yourself. Nar narcissism, uh, 
Yeah, that's true. That it was mediated from the colonies. But sorry, what I wanted to say is that uh, narcissism is precisely a defense against desire. Desire is disentering. It throws you out of yourself. In this sense, I would have agreed with my Buddhist critics who claim that in some sense Buddhism accepts this. Do not compromise your desire. Because in your desire, you are not reduced to your ego, self. Desire is precisely a moment of opening onto the world. In desire, you are vulnerable, open. So again, narcissism is like hatred and, and a, a dance against uh, desire. Can we just have a... Last Should we just have okay. the final question from Maxim yes. and, and a quick answer? So, Maxim Chung, if you if you would take the mic and try to be concise uh, on Buddhist causality. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hey, um, Hi. Yeah, I mean, I can say today, but uh, I don't know whether you. Where, can hear are, where are you now? Because yesterday you appeared to me more authentically Tibetan. Now you are definitely <laughs> not in a Tibetan place. <laughs> yeah, just just moved into a modern space. Yeah, it's, okay. Yeah. I'll just ask a quick question. It's, it's quite simple today. Um, it's about uh, what's your view on. I see there's a potential linkage between uh, the Lusian move to the idea of causation and the Buddhist idea of causality. Uh, about no beginning, no end, and there's idea about process, uh, and there's a, I think there's also the idea of, of emergence in um, coming out of Buddhism. And what's your view on on, on this? First, I blab enough so that I must concede now here that I don't know a lot about. Buddhist notion of causality, apart from these obvious things. I remember when there were debates about science and so on, Buddhists against creationism. Buddhists said very early that creationism, the way Western Christian fundamentalists imagine it, is totally incompatible with Buddhism. That in no way should you refer to Buddhism to... to, to but... but uh, what I would have said is that I wonder, you must know these things better. For me, causality becomes really interesting, and if I may use this cursed word, dialectical, when it becomes retroactive causality, when something that was just an effect originally retroactively posits or reposits its own cause. Something that is an effect becomes a cause of its cause. And I can well imagine, you should teach me, that in this sense, if I were to be Buddhist, I would have said that uh, if uh, the self in this, not pure subject, but the self in this fake sense of self-identity, it's me substantial, isn't a self precisely this type of fake secondary cause? We self is really an alienated effect of the flux of experiences and so on. But the mistake of the self, which is an effect, is to retroactively posit itself as the origin of what it is the effect of. What would interest me is this to locate illusion in this kind of inverted fake causality. And I wonder, you should teach me if you find something of this order in Buddhist, in Buddhist tradition. Because otherwise we are at the level of primitive Marxism. I know the world is complex, phenomena, everything is mediated with everything else and so on. That's nothing. Things become interested, interesting with this retroactive causality or even in a more positive mode, changing the past, not in the sense of recreating its reality. I'm not thinking magically, but... When, as again, I always quote this for me the biggest passage from uh, 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 
T.S. Eliot, conservative, but he was not a total idiot, when he says that each new work of art changes the entire path also. The past appears in a different way. For example, we use the most primitive example. We use the word paganism. Wait a minute. Paganism is a Christian term. If you are a non, non-Christian, none of the three religions of the book, you will never call yourself a pagan. <laughs> Stupid, no? So, uh, uh, this, this would be most interesting, uh, most interesting for me. So the conclusion would have been that uh, uh, the big cheat is for me the problem, here I agree with my critics, that a certain kind of pseudo-Buddhism was appropriated by even the corporate elite. As the, you know, when that, uh, that uh, John Clark, when he says that uh, that this uh, reification, objectivization is the product of modern society. But I would say that for today's capitalism, with its crazy dynamic market speculation, blah, 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 it fits perfectly a certain version of pseudo-Buddhism. You know, pseudo. Like everything is an appearance and so on. And also any capitalists use, uh, corporate capitalists, use oriental wisdom as a kind of pseudo-justification. You earn billions, but then you say to yourself, but this doesn't really matter. All that matters is my inner truth, and so on, and so on. And it would be, uh, it would be, uh, 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 sorry, the guy Thomas, thanks very much, he said something, I just want to answer him, he wanted to bring in Tantra, no? No, Tantra is dirty sex. I'm afraid of Tantra at my age. Sorry, just a dirty reply. No, but, uh, uh, ha, 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 yes. Sir. But uh, do, you, no, do you see what I, do you see what I mean? That it would be in the interest of both sides to get rid of this terrible appropriation of pseudo-oriental thought, it's not even Buddhism, uh, by it somehow fits the incredible speculative, in the financial sense, dynamic of today's corporate capitalism. It's no longer this old Protestant ethics, me, self, manipulating object. No, no, no. It's a much more dynamic, crazy universe. And that's the danger today, I think.